it's visible also. Uh, at the outset, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Chairperson for the kind introduction and uh, definitely ESI for giving this my opportunity and uh, respected Dr. Jindal sir and Dr. Jadeep, not less, is the one who is uh, standing behind this activity and, and a very rare topic, uh, which I was also a little bit jittery when I heard IgG4 related diabetes. Uh, this was some uh, eight to nine months back. A lady was referred to me from a budding neurologist or uh, rheumatologist of Bhopal, and uh, uh, the diagnosis was IgG4 related disease. She had this uh, swelling, submandibular swellings, and a little bit uh, parotid was also enlarged, though now I consider it as something different, and the IgG4 levels were more. And she was on steroid and we later on managed her, but uh, I didn't knew anything about IgG4 related diabetes till then. So this is the dear friends, this is how the things they turn up when the near members in the fraternity, they point out something and something new which comes up in your speciality from the other speciality. And so that was my experience with IgG4 related disorders. Ideally speaking, uh, it is a spectrum of disorders which is having so many things apart from multi-system involvement. There are so many areas uh, around, uh, they say there are 40 points of interest when it comes to IgG4 related diseases, 40 kind of uh, systems which are involved, not system, rather to say there are permutations and combinations which drain somewhere around about 40 places. So I'll be talking about the IgG4 related disorders, it's related endocrinopathies, diabetes management and treatment. The treatment part, as people have already said, uh, this actually came up in the endocrine scene also, as Dr. Kalra was mentioning, uh, one of the MCQ which came, a steroid responsive diabetes. So dear friends, we have now an entity. In this COVID era, we are very worried about steroids causing a lot of problem in our patients, especially diabetic patients. But this is a diabetes where you give steroids and it responds to steroids. What is this immunoglobin G4? It constitutes around 3 to 6% of the circulating immunoglobins. It is one of the lesser, but with respect to that, it is the one of the least available immunoglobins in the blood. And it has got no sp specific triggering mechanisms. Usually they have got cytokines, they have got antibody formation, uh, the T cell stimulation, but it is also not affecting the complementing uh, complement pathway. It contributes as inflammatory response to histamine, bradykinin, and release, which are released from the basophils. And it attracts immunoglobin E followed by snophilia. And basically this involvement in allergization process, this word allergization, previously I thought it's an aberration, but it was again a news to me. And this is a word which has been frequently used nowadays. So this molecule immunoglobin G4 is basically involved in allergization process, which makes uh, us prone to allergies and it has got its effect, which is a multi-system effect. So IgG4 related disorders, frankly speaking, lymphocytoplasma cytic infiltrations with a, pr a predominance of IgG4 positive plasma cells in the affected tissue. This is what it happens. And it leads to obliterative fibrillitis and increased number of isnophils. Basically the glands, they get fibrosed and they don't secrete. If they don't secrete, there is retention. And the serum immunoglobin G4 levels are elevated. As per the assay, it can be more than 135, 121. In some, it can be more than 86. Uh, the main crux of it, at the very start of it, I'm mentioning what I'm supposed to mention at the end of it. It responds to glucocorticoids. And the fibrosis has a characteristic. This is very typical. And dear friends, this has to be <laughs> important. Uh, it is very characteristic story form pattern typified by a cartwheel appearance of the arranged fibroblast and inflammatory cells and tissue isnophilia. This is very characteristic and this is how it is there in the histopathology slides. I will not go in much of the detail, but the story form appearance and the particular appearance of this is something very characteristic of making this IgG4 related disorders. Pathogenesis, when it comes to pathogenesis, it has got autoimmune basis, it has got triggering of the other systems. It has got the acquired environmental factors. 
Apart from that, there is little bit of genetic predisposition and the important role primarily it centers around B cells and T cells. And there are several autoantigens which have been identified and many more I will say will come in future like galactin-3, lemonin, and anexin. The IG4 antibodies in this disease are not pathogenic. They are not pathogenic, but rather represent an epiphenomenon, something which has led to this allergization and has led to increase in, phenomenally increase in IgG4 levels. And that is how it helps you in making the diagnosis. I'll be covering that in subsequent slides. So what is, uh, again, the no unique international statistical classification? Uh, I think I'm audible. Yeah. So this makes the performance of rigorous epidemiologic studies challenging. In Japan, the prevalence of the disease has been reported to be approximately 0.28 to 1.08. The maximum data is from Japan. And the credit goes to Japanese people. They brought this disease in light. And worldwide accepted criteria for IgG4 related disease will enable more precise epidemiological studies. So we, th this is an era where this is basically an area where the newer ones, the new endocrinologists, they can usher into as a special interest for because there are so many endocrinopathies, though they are rare, but they are actually now we are witnessing endocrinopathies with IgG4 related disorders. So predominantly it is seen in the middle aged and older men. Women are not the ones who are primarily affected because these autoimmune disorders, they have predilection for women, but that is where the, there is a difference when it comes to IgG4 related disease. Clinical manifestations, again, this IgG4 related disease can involve one of the multiple organs and manifestation of this disease has been demonstrated in nearly every organ. Patients often present with subacute development of the mass of the affected organ, like an orbital pseudotumor, eye swelling or a renal mass, renal, you can doubt if there is a renal cell carcinoma, nodular lesions in the lung, the x-ray will show uh, nodular lesions, and somehow, somehow you will land up with diagnosis like tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, and many things, and it may be, or there is a diffuse enlargement of pancreas. So multiple organs are affected and 60 to 90% of the patients with IgG4 related disease and lymphadenopathy is a common feature. So dear friends, you need to be a clinician. You need to examine the patient as a whole in a clinical practice, in a busy clinical practice. Very sorry to say, sometimes we are only juggling with the sugar levels and the other parameters. And uh, most of the times uh, we find it hard to examine the patient with respect to the clinical part also. So that happens. I'm not saying it's a general rule for all, but it is happening, those who see patients in huge volume. So there are diverse manifestations. I will go this slide in a very fast way. See, it can lead to autoimmune pancreatitis, cholangitis, myculix disease, and uh, sclerosing cilaginitis, that is cutness tumor, and inflammatory bowel orbitocytosis. So there are so many things. And the list is long. Clonic sclerosing erotitis, periotitis, Riddle's thyroiditis is a matter of concern for endocrinologists. It can also lead to recurrent Hashimoto's kind of thyroiditis also. So this is something interstitial pneumonitis and uh, kidney disease. So, and what is more important for us is hypophysitis. It leads to hypopituitarism and sometimes pachymeningitis. So there are so many things. So let's come to this IgG4 related endocrinopathies. They are rare, around three to 6% of this IgG4 dis related diseases. They actually drain with endocrinopathies. And the primarily the endocrinopathy is pituitary insufficiency and uh, thyroid involvement in the form of readers like of uh, thyroiditis. So that is something very typical. And uh, diabetes insipidus has been reported in some of the cases because this particular pituitary mass, sometimes we doubt, we do lots of investigations. And then later on, since we are not aware of, this IgG4 has to be kept in mind and it should be excluded when you have a doubt of the etiopatho of your particular pituitary mass. Secondary diabetes is an entity which is basically because of autoimmune pancreatitis. And that is something which is not directly, it's basically an effect of the disease affecting pancreas and leading to high sugars. So autoimmune pancreatitis should be the main center focus of my today's talk. So let's have brief about this autoimmune pancreatitis, 
is an uncommon form of pancreatic inflammation and has a dramatic response to glucocorticoid therapy. So it can appear radiographically as a focal mass that is indistinguishable from pancreatic cancer. Nowadays, we get so many patients who are having very high levels of sugars. And when we go for imaging, and for the first time they have been reported as this, and there is a pancreatic mass. There is again a pancreatic and carcinoma itself is also causing these kind of presentation. So there is, we are sometimes in dilemma. This is also one of the differential cause, but dear friends, the good thing about it is it is curable. So it can lead to pancreatic insufficiency, fibrosis and other complications and elevated immunoglobin G4 as a biomarker for autoimmune pancreatitis helped to establish the disorder as one of the cause for chronic pancreatitis. There are subtypes, autoimmune pancreatitis 1, 2, and no other features like AIP with NOS and IgG4 related disorder. So let's talk about IAP1 in a brief, uh, this slide is where I will go very fast, and present with painless obstructive jaundice, and one third of the cases are discovered in asymptomatic patients undergoing evaluation for pancreatic mass, pancreatic enlargement, or pancreatic drug structure. These are very common things, and sometimes we don't pay heed to this, and a cholestatic pattern of liver test elevation or diabetes mellitus. And type 1 AIP is generally seen in males in six or seven decades of life with elevation of serum IG4 greater than two times of the upper limit of normal. So the type 1 AIP may present as an isolated disorder or as a, or as a part of an IgG4 related disease with the other organ involvement. This other in order organ involvement is one of the basic features which differentiates it from AIP2. So AIP2 is, uh, it is more of a pancreas, uh, around pancreas, and there are the is confined to pancreas and may have a cholestatic pattern. And uh, the rest of the things are patients are younger, basically. In the first one, it was fifth or sixth decade. This is third or fourth decade of life. And males are males and females are equally affected. So little bit difference. So how do you approach this? This typical uh, banana appearance of this uh, particular uh, sausage appearance of pancreas with that underlying border is basically what we see in MRI. And basically, this enlarged pancreas with featureless borders and delayed enhancement with or without a capsule-like rim. And MRCP is the diagnostic imaging modality for the choice of AIP. And uh, complications, it may lead to atrophy, insufficiency, and definitely our topic of concern, pancreatogenic diabetes mellitus. So when to suspect? History, clinical examination, detailed clinical examination, uh, especially with respect to seeing all lymphadenopathies is definitely important. It will add on to, uh, to your uh, clinical findings and patient presenting with painless jaundice, abdominal pain, or a diffusely enlarged pancreas or pancreatic mass on imaging and presence of other autoimmune conditions. These are the things where you can suspect that you are dealing with something like that. And this is how it appears the sausage-shaped pancreas in autoimmune pancreatitis when you do MRCP. So the endoscopic ultrasonic guided biopsy is one of the modality uh, to differentiate and to make the diagnosis. And this is basically talks about uh, the IgG4 positive cells with at least two of the following periductal lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate around the duct, obliterative phlebitis or swirling collagen fibers that is story form fibrosis I've told you regarding that in one of those initial slides. That is very typical about this AIP. And idiopathic duct centric pancreatitis is characteristic for by a granulocyte epithelial lesion in pancreatic duct. And that is very there for type two AIP. Uh, not going much in detail, the serum IgG4 greater than two times of the upper lipid of normal is also suggestive of AIP. And if you do a glucocortical trial, that has to be done after excluding everything. Dear friends, this we all know, we are all uh, in the fraternity from the endocrinology, we know about, uh, but this trial of a uh, glucocortical trial will help you in pinpointing. And this is why they have this given this uh, diagnostic criteria they talk about the parenchymal imaging, the ductal imaging, other organ involvement that has to be ruled out, that has to be seen, and the history of the uh, pancreas with respect to obliteration, fibrosis, lymphocytic infiltration. And lastly, dear friends, it is the response to steroids, which will help you. And this is the algorithm which talks about uh, 
for the if there is an indication if the you need to wait if you are not being in a state of doubt or uh, if you have this absolute uh, there are if there is, are contraindications for glucocorticoid you need to take in mind and definitely accordingly you can give prednisolone mm -hmm. or immunosuppressants like rituximab and uh, definitely this algorithm is uh, something which will evolve when our fraternity will also come into the scene right now majority of the things are been written and seen by people who are not basically endocrinologists so dear friends this is again an opportunity for us right now to usher into an area of rare form of diabetes that is igg4 related disorders leading to aip leading to secondary diabetes so to today the cornerstone of therapy is steroid basically around 0.6 uh, mg of uh, per kg body weight of prednisolone later on it has to be tapered and in japanese uh, studies they have given it at low doses for a longer period of time there are people who don't respond it uh, rituximab is also one of the option and the other immunosuppressants like uh, azathioprine cyclophosphamide and uh, other methotrexate has been tried so and surgical intervention is required whenever there is basically uh, i have been talking about the phlebitis part i have been talking about the enlargement of the gland i have been talking about the hydronephrosis i have been talking about the pressure lesions over the pituitary and all that has to be taken care of if it is there when it comes to igg4 related disorders to summarize igg4 related disorder is an increasingly recurrent syndrome of unknown etiology the hall hallmarks of igg4 related disease are lymphoplasma cytic tissue infiltration mainly igg4 positive plasma cells and small lymphocytes and the fibrosis associated with igg4 related disease usually has a characteristic story form pattern typical of a cartwheel appearance of the arranged fibroblast and inflammatory cells endocrinopathies are common aip leads to diabetes it is steroid responsive diabetes and we need further research so dear friends thank you for giving me this opportunity for talking about one of the rare forms of diabetes that is igg4 related diabetes thank you thanks a lot